Hello and welcome to Business 7. I'm Jo Marie Daddy, as always joined by my colleague, <laughs> Philippus Usiku. Philippus, thank you for joining us once again in the studio. Thank you. You're looking forward to tonight's program. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's um, great to be here. <laughs> very much. Mm. We've got a jam-packed agenda for you. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Connection. It's in the human touch. The feeling of belonging. It inspires us and empowers us. Creates clarity from complexity. It starts new conversations, unlocks the power of advice, and makes an impact on your life. At Alex Forbes, we pioneer insight to provide you with advice that connects your decisions of today to your impact tomorrow. Right, let's put this show into first gear. <laughs> Philippus, yesterday um, the new vehicle sales stats uh, were released and it does look rather promising. But why is it so important that we monitor new vehicle sales um, as an indicator of the economy? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, very, it's great news to hear that uh, vehicle sales are picking up. Uh, because vehicle sales, in my opinion, is a very key economic indicator. Um, if you look at the, the Namibia Consumer Price Index weight, um, transport is one, it carries the third largest yes. weight. So, and you also know that the economy is boosted by, by consumer spending. So if there is an increase in, uh, in vehicle sales, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good sound for the economy. And also transport is one of our key economic sectors. And um, it's just not about transport. So vehicle sales have other uh, ripple effects on other sectors. Um, for example, the commercial vehicles that are being used in um, in the tourism sector, the construction sector, and also just for uh, passenger vehicles, because when people are buying, it means that um, they will be spending money on fuel, for money. example. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's really an interesting development, and it's, it shows that, yeah, economy is picking up, and yeah. Very much so, and indeed, welcome news. But um, uh, you can read the entire story on the front page of Business 7 uh, today in Republic K in Algemeine Zeitung, and the Namibian Sun, or on our Facebook pages, or you can uh, follow us on LinkedIn. But also, we spoke uh, to the experts to interpret uh, the latest vehicle sales. And as always, our first stop was Simone Storm. Making her debut in uh, the Best 7 studio is Angeline Book. She's a research assistant at Simone Storm. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Angelique. Thank you, Jo Marie. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, you economists are very um, fond of talking about uh, green shoots in the economy. But I think for the purpose of this conversation, maybe we should be talking about Riffing up some engines because it's all about <laughs> vehicle sales, and um, February situation looks a lot better. Can you summarize for us in a nutshell what happened in February with new vehicle sales in Maria? So in February we definitely saw an increase. Um, vehicle sales equal to one thousand one hundred and three units that were sold in February. Um, this is a twenty four percent, twenty four point nine percent increase from the previous February of twenty twenty two, which is great news for us. And uh, compared to January, we see that this is a. Uh, a 36.3% increase. For January, we only sold 798 vehicles compared to 1,103. And uh, we saw that 51% of these, of these vehicles sold were passenger vehicles and 44% were light commercial vehicles. And uh, further to further that stat, uh, we saw that 46% of these vehicles were Toyotas and then um, 160 were VWs in units and then 53 were Kias. Great and you've mentioned a lot of stats now and um, can you tell us a little bit about how that compares to what we've seen in the past? So in the past the vehicle sales have been sluggish um, for the economic term which means that it 
it has not been increasing as as much as we would like to see it. But I think it is starting to reach pre-pandemic levels compared to the past, whereas this has been the highest since I think 2019, 2018. 2018, exact, right, yeah. yes. 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 So certainly um, a lot of improvement there, even though it's still considerably below the peak of what we've seen. In your view, what has driven this latest performance, this good performance? Um, I recently had a, had a conversation with um, stakeholders that work at rental companies, and they said that they have been buying lots of cars to uh, make up for the peak season coming up. So that's also to avoid the, the supply chain issues that they've been seeing. So they want to be ready for the tourism peak season. And um, when I went to look at the data per se, I saw that many of the Toyotas that were, that were sold were mostly off-road um, cars, which coincides with, with what the stakeholder has said. The fact that rental companies um, are looking at getting in more vehicles um, uh, ahead of time. That's also an indication of um, some confidence in the recovery of the tourism sector. Yes, definitely, definitely. So we are we are hoping to see this reflect in our uh, um, hospitality stats report as well. And and you also touched on supply chain issues. Can you elaborate slightly on that? So we know that ever since the war in Ukraine and between Russia and U Ukraine, there has been some issues with the semiconductor. In our previous report, we have spoken about, or previous reports, because it's actually been an ongoing issue. Um, Ukraine supply, supplies neon, almost 50% of neon to the world. And um, ever since the war, they have stopped this. So, and the neon is used to produce the chips. So, uh, that has been causing lots of supply chain issues. And also since China um, had the strict COVID policies, uh, it was very difficult for trade to happen. So there were lots of issues in terms of supply. In terms of the rest of the year, what do you think the outlook looks like? So we did see that the that our government predicted that they will spend 210 million, I mean, yes, 210 million on, on vehicles for the upcoming fiscal year. So if that does materialize, then we do see that uh, vehicle sales will definitely go up. Um, we do we do see that other rental companies will then all, also further this uh, a notion of buying off-road vehicles to facilitate incoming um, or forecasted incoming um, tourism. You made an interesting um, observation in your report about uh, individuals buying cars and uh, that there's still some reluctance um, from the bank side because it might be a risky transaction and that people are now actually buying vehicles cash. Yes, yes. Um, this can be substantiated by the fact that life life insurance claims between 2020 quarter one and 2022 quarter one has equated to 19 billion. So we do, do we do assume that there is money in 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 the economy that's floating around. That's that certainly... people are using to buy uh, vehicles. <laughs> very, very interesting observation from your side. As a final question, you also touched in your report on the issue of um, electric vehicles. Um, what is your take on that? So locally, um, we do see growth, but very slow growth of e electric vehicles. I think globally, it's definitely more apparent because um, they have the facilities for it. For it whereas uh, we are currently, Namibians are scared that we might also be facing load shedding. So <laughs> putting that together with electric vehicles would be a bit of a scare for them as well. So yeah, we do see that electric vehicles will grow, but very, very slowly in our country. Angelique, it was very nice having you on the program. It will certainly not be the last time. Uh, thank <laughs> you for your insights and have a great day. Thank you so much, Joe Marie.
We all know that employee well-being is very, very important for a company. But did you know that it's actually a crucial part of a company's risk management uh, strategy? Now, we have an expert in the studio here. Thank you very much for joining us, Horst Simon. He's uh, the business risk officer at the Capricorn Group. Welcome to our studio. Thank you very much, Jamari. It's nice to be here and thank you for the opportunity to chat about this. Well, of course, you can read Horst's entire article in uh, the printed version of Biz 7 uh, today in uh, the daily newspaper, Schreibulikain, Allgemeine Zeitung, and the Mibian Sun, and you can also read it on our website or on uh, LinkedIn. But uh, let's get back to a conversation about this. Now, in this article, it starts off um, rather intimidating because you talk about affecting effective neuroscience and social neuroscience. What are those? I think we, we, do, we do have the formal academic mm. definitions for those in the article, but I'm not uh, a neuroscientist, I'm a risk <laughs> practitioner. But I think the important part of that is that how do these things affect people's decisions and the perception of risk? Because the management of risk is all about the, per the person's response to a situation yes. of risk, and that's influenced by a whole lot of things. And if we look at different influences over the years, you know, we focused on a lot of the things like culture, like um, background, like um, generations even, but we didn't look at the emotions. And with COVID-19 and the highlight around uh, well-being of our employees, this is also a key element that we need to look at when it comes to the perception of risk and the response to risk. So that links back to the neuroscience where we look at how your emotions and uh, play, play into your decision you take on, on the management of risk. Because people think a lot about it's, it's the historic data that we convert into all these reports, but when the time comes, how you respond, that is what is the key element to the effective management of risk. And I was delighted to see that uh, an influential group like Capricorn um, released this thought le leadership piece by you because um, since COVID-19, it's been an ongoing debate globally, the effect yeah. of the pandemic and um, the consequences and trauma thereof on yeah. um, employees' well-being and how that in the end will impact on, on corporates. Um, a, a healthy employee, now, I'm not talking about me, so you can't, <laughs> you can't cite me, but what does a healthy, a mentally healthy employee look like? Yeah, I think just maybe to take a quick step back, yes. Capricorn Group started with the Risk Culture Builder Program in 2019 when I came back to Namibia specifically to look at risk culture. And then, as you have mentioned, with COVID, there's more focus on it. I think for the healthy employee, the, the key element, we highlight a few things in the article, mm. but the key one to me is that self-motivation. It's that ownership. I own how I respond to a situation of risk. I own my perception of that. Uh, and I need to be aware of, for example, biases that play into this. And I need to be aware of my emotions. When I get up this morning, um, and I'm not in a good mood, I may take the wrong decision uh, with regards to the management of risk in my job. So I need to be aware of those things. So for me, the key element there is that ownership and that self-motivation. Um, there are a few others that we mentioned, but to me, that's the most important thing, that the employee owns it. Um, don't wait for your manager to come and tell you, uh, you know, this is the way you should do it. Uh, own it, know what the shortcomings are, know what your emotions are, and then uh, know that that affects how you respond to that situation of risk. And that doesn't just pertain to the workplace. As we've seen globally, um, it, it is an ongoing movement that of self-awareness yeah. and mindfulness, as they, as they call it, uh, that you should be totally in touch with your emotions so that you can manage them yeah. and detach them sort of from your actions because they can influence uh, your yeah. actions quite drastically. Yeah, they definitely influence your actions and in our focus, how you respond to a situation of risk. Uh, I often in the, in the training sessions, I often use the, 
the example of, of the married men and the, and the single men in the room, and I asked them if you have a fight with your wife or your girlfriend, do you just quietly close the door, pull away and drive within the speed limit? And normally the woman will burst out <laughs> laughing while the men still think on how to answer this question. So yes. And here we have the same scenario. I'm your laughing. emotions <laughs> plays a role. It does indeed, and it has consequences. Yeah. <laughs> We've looked at the, the employee side of things, but what is the role that leaders in corporations and companies can play to promote this well-being? I think, again, I, I, I mentioned a few in the article, but the key one that stand out is that open conversation, creating that environment where people feel safe. You'll see, and you've probably read a lot about the uh, psychological safety aspects and all those things we talk about nowadays, but that to me is the, is, is the important thing. Leaders need to be open to these conversations. Uh, Linking it back to the management of risk and risk culture, the conversations are more important than the reports. Because the reports are normally as at the end of last month or last quarter, but the conversations are what drives the responses. Exactly. And that is, a, that is an important thing, creating that environment where we not go on a witch hunt if you raise something negative. We're going to look at what are the lessons that we learn and how do we take it forward to have effective management of risk in our business. But to have, to feel safe and to have that confidence, there should also be a big element of trust. Yes, definitely. That is, um, you know, it can never exist without that element of trust. And again, there's a lot of research lately around mm. the element of trust um, and also how that got highlighted through the pandemic that we've just Precisely. gone through. Um, that, that people didn't feel that they can disclose that I have COVID. Uh, and then yes, there's also yes. all of a sudden this stigma, stigma. and thing that, that, that come out of it, where we really need to work on how we treat our employees and how we create that well-being for our employees in that open conversation platforms. Uh, in, in all aspects, oh, uh, it's not just uh, from the top, it is horizontal mm -hmm. as well, and it is, from the bottom up as well. Uh, people need to feel free to have those open and frank conversations about risk. Uh, and as we mentioned, be aware of how their emotions influence those conversations and those perceptions. Very much so. And um, as a final question, a roundup comment, um, could you elaborate on how important it is to have positivity in the workplace? It is it's very important. I think you wouldn't have asked the question if it wasn't, but um, the whole world is negative around us. A lot of what we read, a lot of what we hear, a lot of what we see, and we tend to, to, to focus on those negative things and how that affect the way I'm working or the, the way my company is operating. Um, we need to look at that. Risk is always risk and opportunity. In every situation of risk, there's also a situation of opportunity. So we need to move this backward thinking of risk management that is all about reports and colors and those kind of things to a more positive forward thinking. Where are the opportunities? Where can we take more risk for more reward without compromising the quality of what we're doing and the profitability of our business? It has been delightful. Uh, talking to you. Please read the article. It is extremely insightful. Thank you very much for driving, you and Capricorn, <laughs> for driving um, this agenda too, because it's incredibly important, not only in Namibia's economy, but globally. Horst Simon, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Germany. I enjoyed being here. Thank you. Every day, you make choices that make you legendary. Journey together with us on the path to securing your legacy as a member of the League of Legends. With the Select Platinum Bundle Fee Premium Bank offering, you will access tools that will enable you to thrive. If you earn $850,000 Namibian dollars per annum or more, you can apply for this offering today via bankvento.com.na for only $447 Namibian dollars per month. Bank Vento, a member of Capricorn Group.
And Lupus's program isn't just about what is happening in the Namibian economy and um, uh, the business. We also look at Africa. And uh, uh, as we do every week, let's have a look at the business highlights for the week in Africa as supplied to us by Reuters. Here are five business stories making headlines in sub-Saharan Africa this week. S&P Global downgraded its outlook on South Africa to stable from positive. The rating agency said economic growth in South Africa was facing increasing pressure due to infrastructure constraints, particularly from severe electricity shortages. Better news for South Africa's Standard Bank, though, which reported a 33% rise in four-year profit. South African banks had a good run last year on the back of increasing interest rates and a rebound in economic activity after the global health crisis. Uganda said on Thursday it expects to start generating at least 1,000 megawatts from nuclear power by 2031. The announcement came as the country moves to diversify its sources of electricity and accelerate its energy transition. The World Bank is pausing future work with Tunisia after statements by the country's president on migrants from African countries triggered racist harassment and violence. That's according to a note sent to staff by World Bank President David Malpass. He said the World Bank viewed the situation as deeply concerning, but viewed steps announced by the Tunisian government to protect and support migrants and refugees as positive. And Stellantis said on Wednesday it had reached a preliminary agreement with South African authorities to build a production site by 2025. It will be its first in the country. Stellantis is the world's third largest auto manufacturer by sales and the owner of brands including Fiat, Peugeot, Citroën and Jeep. Under the sweltering morning sun, Zimbabwean workers stack tobacco leaves on a tractor. But this farm is unlike most in the male-dominated sector. The majority of the employees are women. Many are survivors of gender-based violence. The 150-acre farm is run by Michelle Gwatimba. She left a lucrative job as an IT technician in Zimbabwe's bustling capital Harare. When I did come, it was more to just take a breather, um, some fresh air, and decide what to do next. Timber says it became clear that there was a lot of gender-based violence in the settlements around the farm. Those are the communities from which the business gets most of its staff. We would be hearing a lot of stories. There was a lot of women who would then come to us asking for food or for shelter or somewhere to run away from. Because I don't know, an idle mind, you know, is a devil's workshop. So we ended up just employing all of these women. Gwatimba says her Tsoro Greenfields farm provides employment to over 80 families. She and her team have put in place a strategy that, on any project, be it tobacco or maize or soybeans, 75% of the workforce are women. Their involvement in the sector is not just good for the women, Gratimba says. Once we have more women in the space, I feel like more can be done. It builds our economy, it takes a lot of, of families out of hunger and desperation. Um, all of it has a domino effect. We produce more and the economy flourishes. It's more than two decades since the chaotic land reform program under Robert Mugabe that dispossessed thousands of white commercial farmers. Today, Zimbabwe is witnessing a new wave of young black farmers growing tobacco. It's a cash crop. Green gold, as it's known, made up 12% of Zimbabwe's exports in January, according to official figures. Gwatimba describes the sector as intimidating, but also one that is so rewarding. That's it for another week. Philippus, a whole lot of food for thought there. Um, indeed. So, um, yes, we hope you enjoyed the programme. We'll join you again next week, same time, same place. From me, goodbye. Goodbye from me, Philip Asusiko. <laughs>
thank you so so much to FNB. What an experience! I never got to do shopping in five minutes, but look at all this.